Hey there, it's Pete Moriarty here. Another podcast episode for you. This was recorded with Chris Reynolds from The Business Method, and he interviews seven and eight figure business owners all over the world about how they found success. Now, in this episode, I shared a few of the secrets about how I was able to be listed as one of Australia's top 10 entrepreneurs under 30 four times. So I think I, the first time was 25, and I missed out one year just before I was 30. Uh, but how I ended up on those lists, I talked about how I created a truly location independent business and why as a millennial business owner, uh, it's so important to do things differently, uh, but also how all business owners um, of any age, of any stage of business can learn from younger business owners entering the market. Now, we also talked about some tech tools. Always make sure I do that to make sure you keep your operations clean. Uh, and we talked about a lot of my favorite tools, Dialpad, Asana, Podio, Slack, Zendesk, G Suite. We talked, well, what was G Suite? Now Google Workspace. Uh, we talked about all of those and how you can make all of those work together swimmingly in your business. Uh, and of course, we talked about the future of tech and automation as well, where I think things are going. If you want to keep up with the competition, if you want to be a savvy business and be in front of things, we'll make sure you check out this episode. Let me know what you think down in the comments. If you liked it, give me a thumbs up. Uh, and if you want to see more of this, hit the subscribe button. And I look forward to seeing you in another video. And you have to learn from these younger businesses. You have to learn from the Facebooks and the Googles and the Amazons and all of these businesses and start reinventing yourselves. This is Chris Reynolds and welcome to the Entrepreneur House podcast. The Entrepreneur House is a business accelerator for entrepreneurs creating events and retreats all over the world. Picture yourself with other high-level entrepreneurs in the northern mountains of Thailand, October 26, 2017. It will be full of masterminds, workshops, advisors, like-minded entrepreneurs, and of course, some fun adventure. If you're ready to take your business to the next level with other successful entrepreneurs, be sure to contact us ASAP at theentrepreneurhouse.com. And now, on to today's episode. Our world is changing every single day. The advancement in technology and business in the past five years has absolutely skyrocketed and today's guest runs a business that is on the front lines of all the tech, software, and business development. His name is Peter Moriarty and he is the founder of IT Genius. Peter's been named one of Australia's top 10 entrepreneurs under 30 by Smart Company multiple times. His company works as a partner with Google to take other businesses to the next level by smoothing out their systems, operation, and automation. Today on the show, we will address how Peter grew IT Genius to one of Australia's most recognizable companies, how technology is affecting business today, and what Peter recommends to create a seven-figure location independent business. Without further ado, you guys, let's welcome Peter Moriarty to the show. Welcome, Peter, to the podcast. How are you today? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for joining us. Where are you calling in from? Uh, from Sydney, uh, Sydney, Australia. Is that your home base? This is actually my home base. Uh, crazily enough, I'm not here as uh, as often I would like to be at the moment. But uh, but yeah, this is this is home base. Born and bred in Sydney, and I still call uh, still call this place home as well. And for the most part, you you are pretty location independent with your business. Do you guys have a an office space with your business, or is everything remote? Uh, we've got an office space in Sydney, which is a bit of a virtual office. Uh -huh. uh, every now and again, we do still have the odd client who's based in Sydney who wants to, you know, have a, a boardroom session or or a quick chit chat. Uh, but since our most of our customers are spread across Asia Pacific, primarily Australia and New Zealand, and and that's just so large, uh -huh. it's very rare that we deliver our services face to face. Most of them are delivered uh, remotely, and we've we've tried to do that from day one. I love the fact that you're like these days in your business, the odd client is somebody that's in town, actually physically close to you. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. We, we worked it out once that only 20% uh, of our total customer base are in Sydney, in the, in the city where we're officially based in. Um, so that's a pretty good indication that we've been working on uh, growing and scaling a business with the focus on remote delivery for a number of years now. Well, we want to learn more about you and your business and IT Genius. And um, so we're going to give you the mic for a couple of minutes. Give us a history of how you became the entrepreneur that you are today. Oh, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing it. Um, look, I started out as a, as a kidpreneur uh, when I was in my teens. Um, it's, a, it's an IT consultancy that we run. And I started out as a your average computer whiz down the road, helping people with their computers and, you know, installing antivirus software and those kind of things. Um, and in my early 20s, I decided I wanted to make a business out of it, start a company, and, and I did that. Um, and it's grown and, and morphed, and now is uh, what we've settled on is we're a, a pure play 
cloud consulting business. Um, and so typically we're helping small and medium business owners get their technology sorted out. Um, and primarily what we're aiming to do is help business owners have more freedom, whether that's freedom with time, more time, freedom with location independence, um, or just a bit more flexibility in how they do things. Um, a typical customer for us might be someone in an early stage business uh, that's growing, but things are out of sync. So they're using Dropbox and you know they're getting sync conflicts or their phone's not talking to their computer um, and they don't have time to spend all weekend on the phone to support to get stuff sorted out. Um, you know, We help them kind of get their stuff synchronized. Um, and the other type of customer that we help is someone with a more established business. Um, you know, they've they've built their business up. It's more than five or ten years old. They're an established business owner. They might have five or ten or fifteen or twenty employees, probably all in one location. But yeah. they've been doing things the old way. You know, they've got like a Microsoft small business server kicking around in their office. Um, they're probably spending lots of money on an IT consultant, and someone else is making all their IT decisions. Uh, you know, they're all going through an external consultant. They're paying a lot of money for, and they're not really sure exactly what's happening. IT is just a black box that they throw money at. Uh, and so for those customers, we help empower them to be the technology leader in their business. And, you know, they save a bunch of money on their IT, um, but we open up the possibilities for those business owners to have a bit more flexibility in their, uh, you know, in their location. Um, if someone's a baby boomer and they're maybe over 40 or 50 years old, they don't necessarily want to grab a backpack and, and tour the world, but they might want to take a few more holidays and be able to be productive mm -hmm. while they're away from the business. So um, they're, they're the kind of business owners that we work with and, and typically help out. So when you were young, when you're starting out at 15, did you know that you wanted to be an entrepreneur or this was going to be your career path? Oh, I, I knew I was, I was one yeah. of those kids, like when I was five or six years old, I was stealing stuff and selling it, um, or making bootleg copies of CDs or, um, <laughs> even, uh, I, I was six foot, I was six foot when I was, um, in my early teens, I was a really tall kid. Wow. And so I could go to the news agent and, um, and buy a porno magazine without them asking for an ID. And then I'd <laughs> sell them to my mates in the schoolyard. So <laughs> all kinds of, all kinds of stuff like that I did. Uh, but I, I decided when I was about 15, 16 years old, that I would start a legitimate business because I kept getting into trouble for all of my illegitimate ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it's it's entrepreneurship is, is pretty much in my blood. I, I was I was born with it. It, it just it just kind of happened. And and how long ago was that when you started this part of the business? So I, I started this business when I was twenty, I think. Okay. Uh, I think yeah, just just turning twenty, and uh, that was eight years ago now. Uh, so still, still under thirty. The business has been going going strong eight years. Uh, you know, very healthy, growing a lot. Um, we we did some acquisitions last year, so it even boosted the growth of the business, which was um, a little bit scary. Came with all of its own challenges, but um, but you know, going very well. And it, you've actually been awarded one of Australia's top ten entrepreneurs under thirty by Spark Company and Australian Ant Hill. Is that right? Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, really, really, uh, you know, obviously proud to win those awards. Um, you know, it's funny when I was in high school, they didn't have like, you know, awards for entrepreneurs. Uh, there, there wasn't any recognition for entrepreneurs. I was I was that weird person who didn't want to go to university when all of my friends were were going to university, all of my friends were uh, going on to higher education. Um, so it, it's yeah, it was really lovely to be uh, to be awarded that it's a, a nice, uh, nice accolade to have. Was your family supportive of you not going to university and continuing to be an entrepreneur? Oh, it's interesting. My my parents actually had differing opinions. Um, mm -hmm. My parents split up when I was eight years old, and um, my mum is an academic. She mm -hmm. loves ongoing education, always has, and it's been a really big part of her life. And she was, for the most part, especially in the early days, probably not so encouraging. She wasn't discouraging, but you know, not so encouraging. Um, whereas my dad has been a business owner for over 25 years. He's a carpenter builder, has run his own business, manages contractors, does all the bills, does his own taxes. Uh, so he was very much coaching me, mentoring me, you know, really supporting me at a very practical level, even when I was still a teenager. Um, and so right at the very start, he was saying, well, you know, Pete, here's how you send your first invoice and here's how you call a customer and ask them to, you know, pay you. And here's, you know, here's how you chase them when they don't pay you. You know, all of those basics um, I really got in the early days from my dad. Um, but, um, uh, you know, as, as I kind of grew older and, and they realized once I was in my mid-20s, okay, well, you know, this is this is Pete's path. They've, they've both been uh, quite supportive of me in more recent years. That's great. Now, I'm curious because we had another guest on the show, Candice Gallick, who 
hit 30 under 30 in the US for Forbes, I think. And oh, wonderful. I'm, I'm curious, like, is there any hacks or tricks or tactics that you could share with us? Because I'm sure there's a lot of entrepreneurs listening that would like to, to be awarded something like this. Like, how, <laughs> how did it come about for you? Uh, well, I mean, look, interesting. I've, I've been on there four or I think maybe five years um, in a row now, which is pretty wow. cool. Um, wow. I think... I think that, and I don't say that to brag. I, I say that with with uh, an important backstory, and, and you'll understand it in a moment. Um, I think the most important thing um, with media, and I learned this from a friend of mine, Jack Delosa, is to to be memorable and and to really be be someone that um, it's easy for the media to write about. Um, you need to have a story around you. Um, I've, I've got a great story that works really well, which is when I was 15, I had a backpack and I had a push bike and that's, I literally rode between my clients because I was in a rural area and there wasn't public transport. That's, it's a great little catchphrase and, and people love that. Um, I think the important thing is, is that, um, you know, it's not just a matter of putting in the most amazing award submission because we didn't just put in an award submission and all of a sudden, Hey, Presto started winning awards. Mm -hmm. We started building relationships with, um, media agencies and outlets for a number of years before we started receiving those awards. And how it started was us contributing articles, contributing blogs, um, submitting to, um, in Australia, we have a website called Source Bottle. Um, I think there is a US equivalent, but I've forgotten the name where it connects journalists with uh, business owners and experts. Um, so the journalists want, it's like a marketplace. The journalists mm -hmm. want a want an expert to comment on a story and um, and you know business owners want exposure so it brings the two um, the two together in a in a kind of virtual dating app for uh, for shout outs in the media so um, building relationships and getting your um, getting your content um, out there and becoming known in the media first is a surefire way to then after you've built that relationship you're much more likely to be considered for those kind of awards uh, because what they usually do is they'll they'll look at their list of people who they've written about over the last few years and they'll say okay well Who's the movers and shakers, and, and what are they up to? And if you're uh, visible and 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 relevant and and uh, you know and front of mind for those uh, journalists who are putting them together, you've got a much better chance of being involved. Peter, I want to ask you. I know there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there that are working really hard to make their business more location independent. And I think you've guys, based on the testimonials I saw on your website, you've done a pretty good job with that. So what do you think some entrepreneurs are really kind of missing or some tips that they could apply to their businesses to really separate themselves from a physical location and be more location independent? Uh, look, I'd say, and, and, and unpre completely unprepared on this question, two uh -huh. things come to mind. Um, one would be, you need to have, sac you need to be able to sacrifice. And what I mean by that is there are some products, there are some services, there are some, uh, niches, um, for example, that may just not work with, uh, you know, with a remote work or, or a remote lifestyle. Um, you know, one of the easy ones would be that if you would like to travel Europe and you're going to be sleeping at the time, uh, that your customers in North America or in, Asia Pacific are in their, uh, you know, going about their day-to-day -day business and you're in some kind of emergency business where something might go wrong and, and you need to respond to that uh, issue within, let's say, an hour or within two hours or, you know, your team need to escalate to you something important that's gone down and, and they need to get in touch with you, then, you know, you probably don't want to be waking up at, woken up at two o'clock in the morning or have your phone buzzing or going off. Um, you know, those kind of businesses might not work. So the, the first thing would be, you know, be open to to sacrificing certain products or services that might not work. Um, mm. One of the sacrifices that we had to make was we had a number of clients that were based in Sydney that we used to do on-site IT support for. And that worked really well for us and we could deliver on it um, because we do have some staff here in Sydney. Um, however, the challenge was that we, you know, our customers in our, and our broader business strategy is right across Australia um, and New Zealand, primarily they're our, our two primary markets. Um, and we just weren't really able to scale that service very well. So we had to go back to those customers and say, hey, look, you're paying us a lot of money. Uh, you know, some of them were paying us to the tune of thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year. Um, we had to go back to those customers and we had to say, look, sorry, this is, this is just not going to work. Um, we need to kind of pull back and scale back to servicing you remotely. It's going to be a fraction of the cost. Um, some of them had savings of 75% on our services and remained clients, which they were very happy about. Um, but we had to make that change. Um, 
that would probably be the uh, the first one. And the second point, because I spent so long on the first one, I've just forgotten. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe we'll have to come back to it. Um, now, the question was, what are, what, are, what are people missing, right? Yeah, what are they missing or what can they apply like to their operations to make it more location independent? I think the second one is probably going to be um, plan for it from the start. Mm-hmm. Um Plan, plan, for, plan for a business that, that you think is going to work remotely. And, you know, if you're, if you're already in a business um, that is quite localized, then yes, well, you might, it might be more of an um, answer number one, which is sacrifice. But if you're in the lucky situation where you're still growing and you've still got the opportunity to kind of move things around, plan for what do I want my business to look like in two years, in five years? What's the structure going to be? What's the delivery mechanism going to be? What are the, te- what are the teams going to look like? How much of my time will I be spending on it? Uh, how much will be allocated to team members and then plan out, okay, well, you know, what, what would work in a remote scenario based on what I want to do? What are some tools that you guys are using that you recommend your clients use to kind of clean up their operations? Uh, look, it, it really depends on what stage of business you're at. If, if you're currently, um, you know, not set up with the basics and, and I would say if you're chained to your office and there are many businesses that are chained to their office, mm-hmm. there's two main products that will chain you to an office and these happen to be the two that we help fix. <laughs> one, of, um, one of those is a phone system. Um, and so we resell uh, with the Australian New Zealand distributor for a cloud-based business phone system called Dialpad. Um, and you can head to itgenius.com forward slash Dialpad, um, check that out there. And Dialpad allows you to have localized numbers for the country that you're in, um, but you can access and make calls just like you can with Skype from anywhere in the world. Now, where Dialpad is special is it operates just like a PBX, which is the name for a traditional phone system with desk phones sitting on desks and all that that you would see in a standard corporate office. Um, It works the same way in that it lets you transfer calls, do call queues, have on hold music, um, you know, have ring groups that go to your team. Um, And we've got a a, a team that spans multiple countries. um, And what it does is it allows us to operate calls with our customers because we do calls every single day. We're on the phone all day long with our customers um, and and operate across a distributed team as if we were in the same office with all of the same features and functionality, you know, voicemail, email and all that kind of stuff. That would be number one. Um, Number two is... um, and, and these are really unsexy topics, right? File storage, <laughs> that's good. Emails, no, that's good. It's good. It's good. Uh, video, video conferencing. Um, and the obvious solution to that is Google Cloud or G Suite. It used to be called Google Apps and Google for Work and uh-huh. a few different names over the years, but it's, uh, it's called G Suite. Um, and that's effectively Gmail, Google Drive, Google Docs, uh, but the business version of those. Um, and so what that means is you've got your file server in the cloud. You've got your collaboration on documents. Um, you've got your, uh, uh, you know, your, your communication with Google Hangouts, with, with video calls and all those kind of things. Um, and it allows your team members to have the business tools that they need to get their work done without having to email files back and forward, without having to save something in Dropbox and wait for it to synchronize. And, oh, no, you've got a conflicted copy because two people worked on it at the same time. Um, you, do, you don't have to vpn or 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 dial in to to a server sitting somewhere you can just skip all of that stuff um so that that'd be the two key ones um and i think if you're a growing business if if you're a new business and and you started out and you already have all these systems in place Mm -hmm. that's fantastic um you know if you've started out with zero.com for your accounts you know cloud-based accounting system if you started out with um with google for business for all your emails that's wonderful as well um I would probably say if you've already got all of these systems, the next step up would be um, a great task management system um, so you can collaborate on tasks, projects, and objectives with your team. We love Asana, um, asana asana.com. It's free for up to 15 people to use, which is great. Um, There's alternatives like Podio and Trello um, and a few others. Um, Our our stablemate is Asana. We've used it um, for ages and we've recommended it to hundreds of clients and uh, and most of them love it as well. You may have mentioned this and forgive me if I'm repeating or asking again, but you're, so you're using Asana. Is that your main form of communication or do you guys have another, do you use Slack or email or what do you guys prefer? We do use Slack for our day-to-day chatter. Um, mm-hmm. And what I really love about Slack is we pull in 
uh, you know, every time somebody um, rates a, a, a ticket, a customer service ticket um, from Zendesk, um, you know, a positive rating, that goes into our main channel and everyone can congratulate each other on that. Um, you know, when a customer, ma- uh, when one of the sales team um, makes a sale, it posts the sale and the value in the um, uh, in the channel as well and who the customer was. So that's a really great kind of day-to-day um, chit-chat pulse for the team. Uh, but video calls, we'll use Google Hangouts um, to connect. Dialpad, uh, we will use for our customer calls. So that's the actual phone system for dialing people in Australia when you want to connect it with them on a phone. Uh, and then, you know, G Suite kind of handles the rest. They're, they're probably the core the core systems that we use to keep our team connected. Um, Asana is really about um, the project management. So like our yearly targets, quarterly targets, monthlies, weeklies, and the pulse of our action items all kind of happen in Asana because, um, you know, Slack, things tend to disappear. You don't want to use that as a to-do list. Mm-hmm. Uh, Slack is really just, you know, the, the replacement for the in-office chatter. If you wanted to lean across the desk and tap someone else over mm-hmm. on the on the shoulder, that's that's what you kind of use Slack for. Yeah. And and by the way, I think all these automation tools and tech tools are incredibly sexy. So feel free to talk about <laughs> yeah. as much as you want. Cool. They, they really do help us entrepreneurs out these days for sure, especially if you are location independent. So I want to ask you this development of technology in business and automation has had some massive growth in the past 10 years or so, five years really. And so uh, I'm curious on your thoughts of what it will be like in the next 10 years. Oh, wonderful. That's a very interesting question. Um, What what we've noticed as market trends are that all of this is changing. You know, cloud was like this new thing eight years ago. um, But now, like, you know, everyone's – it's been absolutely bashed to death and everyone's talking about it. Um, But if we look at the – the market forces behind this technology changing. Um, There's a few market forces that we like to highlight when we look into the future. Um, One of those is better connectivity of internet connections. Um, You can now walk around in the Philippines or all different areas of Southeast Asia, grab a 4G uh, data SIM, and sometimes for 30 Australian dollars, get a couple of gigabytes of data, which you can use for 30 days, and get access to high-speed internet anywhere you are. Um, Not only that, that fixed line internet is getting faster and faster. Many countries are rolling out fiber networks. So that's that's one key market force. Um, Next key market force is, um, as uh, Mark Andreessen says, software is eating the world. Everything is is, you know, becoming um, online cloud across multiple devices, you know, use and work at any time from any device from any browser and, you know, applications like Dialpad are awesome because all of a sudden this thing that used to be a a phone sitting on my desk is now sitting on my computer and I can access it from anywhere and I can make calls from any location. The most interesting thing for me and the most powerful thing for me, and this is what we try and convey to our customers at every stage of their business, is for the early stage businesses, if you're like sub sub five years old, we call you a cloud native you've started halfway through this re- revolution, right? You know, you've mm-hmm. probably already got Dropbox or Google Drive. You've probably already got Gmail for your emails. Uh, you know, you've probably already got your accounts on an online accounting platform of some uh, of some start, uh, of some sort. You're doing great. That's awesome. Keep doing what you're doing. And remember that even when you're going up against the giants of your industry and your competitors, that is your competitive advantage. Your competitive advantage is that you are leaner. Uh, you know, you, you can, you can mm. fight harder. And you have the agility of the sexy, cool Silicon Valley startups that are pivoting every five minutes and rah, rah, rah. Even if you are in what you think is a boring business or a boring industry or, or niche, uh, it doesn't matter. You've, this technology is going to help you to beat the competitors, even the incumbents in your industry. Now, if you're an established business, if you're one of the guys who's been around for the five or 10 years, uh, you know, your business has maybe been doing things the old way and you're looking at your business saying, hey, everything's changing really fast and you, know, you, and you may be starting to feel a bit confused about the future, great. That's good. That tension is good. Lean into the tension. <laughs> um, but the most important thing is that you have to change and you have to position yourself and you have to learn from these younger businesses. You have to learn from the Facebooks and the Googles and the Amazons and all of these businesses and start reinventing yourselves. Just like you know, when you look at the, the Kodaks of the world, 
they saw digital cameras coming and they and they said no 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 we don't believe in that we're just going to we're just going to keep doing this this film thing and hmm. you know they went they went down and and they went under um and so if you don't cannibalize your own business if you are not if you are not absolutely ready and happy to pull the trigger and start cannibalizing your own business even if you launch your 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 cannibalism initiative as a separate <laughs> brand on the side uh you know like you you've just got to do it because someone else is going to and it might be an upstart or it might be one of your existing competitors who does it um there's a business here in australia um called um winning appliances um, and they're they they were a large um brick and mortar style appliance business selling white goods and, and all kinds of things and um i think the father or the grandfather started it and um, and I met the son, and um, interestingly, I actually um, I met him through the the thirty under thirty list. And the son or the grandson, um, his name is John, I believe. Um, and he started an online um, an online uh, store for their business. Now his his father didn't let him use the same brand; they used a separate brand. <laughs> um, but he started an online store, and effectively, that was competing with. And potentially going to cannibalize their brick and mortar business, but he said, "No, no, no. We have to do this. You know, times are changing. This absolutely has to be done." Um, it ended up, of course, being a wild success, um, and they're on the fast growth lists and, and all of those kind of things. Um, so the advice is, you know, if you're one of those established businesses, be ready for the change. But if you can, be the first one to change. Get in there and cannibalize yourself if you have to. What are some ways that you would recommend and that you personally do stay on top of those things to change? Some even even if it's just the mentality that you have around it or some form of uh, media or information or working with other entrepreneurs that helps you stay on top of things that you need to change. Oh, uh, it's it's constant fear <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I mean, our, our catalyst, our catalyst for change is typically uh, Google. Um, you know, we're a Google partner. Um, we're one of their top small business partners um, in Australia mm -hmm. and Google. And I say this nicely. I say this with all of the love possible to Google at times um, seem to think that we shouldn't have to exist. Um, you know, that people should just be able to go to Google and, you know, and, and you know, move their emails off Microsoft and, and onto, the, onto the Google platform without yeah. a partner being involved just by going through a few wizards and clicking a couple of buttons. Um, and, and some, you know, when we feel like Google has that mentality of, of us not needing to exist, that's a little bit scary. Yeah. Um, so, um, look, I don't think that's their true mentality, um, even, even if it might feel like that a bit sometimes. Um, but the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that um, you've, You've kind of got to look at your business, um, look at what you're doing, look at the value that you're providing, and think, okay, well, you know, in what ways, um, in what ways could a machine do this, or could AI do this, or could someone automate what we're doing, or could someone take the repetitive tasks and have a machine or a script um, or somebody offshore in another country do these tasks instead of me? And all you have to do to start thinking in that kind of mindset is look at what's happened to graphic design over the past five years with 99designs and freelancer.com and mm -hmm. Upwork and all of those other sites. You know, how many graphic designers do you know, uh, are, you know, are going around still selling logos for $500 or for $1,000? There's zero <laughs> because you can go to 99designs and you get 50 of them for 100 bucks or 200 bucks or whatever it is. So yeah. um, unfortunately, you have to step outside, turn around and have a look at your business and say, well, how is this going to be done differently? Um, now, what we saw in our industry was um, there were um, uh, consolidations happening. Um, so there were IT service providers either consolidating and forming larger groups um, or selling. And the aim of the game was basically scale. Without scale, it wasn't going to work. And that was because, um, uh, you know, outsourcing and offshoring was starting to happen. Um, the larger players like Microsoft and Google and Apple were starting to bring in services. Um, you know, even businesses can go to the Genius Bar at Apple um, and get free service for their computers. All of a sudden, where is the market for a Mac repair shop? It's just disappeared. Right. Um, and, you know, now that we have cloud-based technology and everything's running in the browser, well, gone are the days of the computer technician who needs to install stuff on a computer. I mean, I use a Chromebook and there is, you know, I don't even need to install antivirus on this machine. <laughs> you yeah. know, it self-updates, it, it gets free updates from Google and it just doesn't even have viruses on there. So um, the key thing is, is to, you know, have a look at, well, 
what if I wasn't needed? And that's the scariest question to ask yourself. It's really, <laughs> it's really, really scary. <laughs> but you've got to, you've got to ask it. And to put a positive light on this, because I don't want to, I don't want to sound like it's all doom and gloom, and you know, everyone's businesses are going to disappear due to AI. What I will say is, know what your value is. Mm-hmm. Know what strategic value that you can bring. What is your your special source, your special magic that you can bring? And that is the, that is a commodity that can't be automated or systemized um, or or you know offshore or, or taken somewhere else. And and use that you know core. Bring your business down to that core of what is the true value that you can create. And um, taking some words from um, Jim Collins, who wrote Good to Great. You know what can you be the best in the world at? What is your superpower? Um, he calls it the, the yeah. it's part of the hedgehog concept. What can you be the absolute best in the world at and do that thing? Build a business around that thing. Peter, I think that's the perfect way to wrap up the show. If the listeners want to reach out and learn more about what you have going on, where could they do that at? ITgenius.com. Uh, we've, of course, got a YouTube channel, plenty of videos there, um, but we, we send heaps of um, updates and alerts and education out to our mailing list. So if you go and grab our ebook um, right on our homepage on ITgenius.com, pop your email in there. That's our essential cloud apps guide. Uh, and we keep that regularly updated with all of our favorite apps um, to help you run your business from anywhere, get more freedom, get more flexibility. Uh, but once you're on that list, you'll get our webinars and, and updates and all those kind of things. Um, and of course, if there is anything that we can do to help, um, you can just um, jump straight on the live chat or, or call through to our team or pop us an email and uh, we'd be more than happy to help discuss your business. And I have to give you a huge thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much for sharing your tips and your tricks and all your wisdom with us. We really appreciate it, my friend. Thank you so much. Chris, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it, and I hope to be back soon. Yeah, I would love to have you. And listeners, we're going to wrap up there. Thank you guys for tuning in once again, and we'll see you all on the next episode. Goodbye, everybody. The Entrepreneur House is a business accelerator for established entrepreneurs. Imagine spending an extended period of time with other successful entrepreneurs working together and growing your business. Day to day, you interact with other driven and smart business people. Spending an extended period of time around them alters your business and your mentality around business. Goals are set, business grows, new partnerships develop, greater profit margins are achieved, the productivity skyrockets for the attendees, and you'll get to have an incredible adventure while doing it. This This year, our main event will be held in Chiang Mai, Thailand. It is four weeks from October 26th to November 24th, 2017. It will be full of workshops, masterminds, and co-working spaces. Be sure to check out the details at theentrepreneurhouse.com as soon as possible. For those